All right. Uh, can you all hear me? Back there? Okay. Um, so my name is Sanjay Kale. I'm a professor of computer science here at University of Illinois. Uh, I'm also a, a co-PI of the uh, Computational Biophysics Group. And I'm going to talk about a topic that probably is farthest from most of your day-to-day -day concerns. So I, at least at the beginning, I would like to get a uh, little show of hands to, for me to understand uh, what, what I'm going to do with my talk. How many of you write programs? By that, I mean C, Fortran, Java <laughs> programs. Wow, fair number. I see. OK. All right, so that's, uh, that's good. Uh, and uh, how many of you uh, write parallel programs? Wow, okay, that's about 5% or 10%, but that's still much larger than I expected. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, how many of you run parallel programs? <laughs> well, hopefully all of you by at the end of the day today. So, uh, so we would have uh, you running some parallel uh, NAMD runs this afternoon. So, I've structured my talk so that it is beneficial to, uh, uh, to the common denominator of you and also still has some interesting aspects to those of you who, are, uh, who know something about par parallel computing. So it's a little bit uh, of a challenge to do that. Uh, and you might notice some of you might get bored with the stuff that you already know and so on. But uh, feel free to follow up later on uh, if there are some interesting uh, topics that you find that you'd like to discuss. Um, so what I would like to do is that uh, essentially to uh, the common denominator aspect is what opportunities are there, what potential is there in this technology called parallel computing, and what are its limitations, what you can do with it and what you cannot uh, do with it. Uh, and then uh, uh, some basic issues of parallel computing will uh, we'll focus on understanding and explaining those basic issues. Um, and that's part one. The part two is the uh, case study. Uh, and what I would like to do is, uh, in, in that part, shoot. Um, seem to have lost one slide there. But uh, what I would like to do in, uh, in the part two uh, is to show you how we went about parallelizing a couple of different applications uh, uh, using, um, using our, the technology that I will describe. So, so what is the opportunity? The opportunity, basically, comes from the fact, if you look at what's happening on the CPU speeds, right? You have a 3 gigahertz 3.06 or something like that. Isn't that what, what you get uh, on, uh, uh, from Dell or something like that on PC? What does that mean? That means every 330 picoseconds, three times in a nanosecond, your CPU is ready to do its next operation. And in fact, in each cycle, each 330 nanoseconds, uh, 330 picoseconds, it actually can typically do two floating point operations, or start and finish two floating point operations. Uh, and of course, there are other processors which can do more than two uh, operations uh, per, per second. They can, some of them can do four operations uh, per cycle and so on. That's really blindingly fast. What that means is, oh, um, uh, by the time the light from that slide reaches you, the, the computer has the light reaches you, the computer has done one, uh, uh, what is it, three, uh, 100, um, maybe 200, 300 floating point operations. Okay, light travels about nine inches in a, uh, in a nanosecond. Um, so, um, all right, so that's really blindingly fast. Uh, what can we do with it? We have, obviously the implication is we can do a lot more computation uh, in a reasonable time. Of course, the other phenomena that goes with that is the computers are very cheap. If you could do fa computers that are as fast as this and still not, uh, still they cost a million dollars or ten million dollars, that wouldn't be as revolutionary. But the fact is that they are this fast and they are dirt cheap. Well, not quite. Two thousand dollars, thousand dollars. Quite cheap compared with uh, what supercomputers used to be a few years ago. So uh, we can do a lot more computation in a reasonable time period. So do we just say happy, we're very happy, we can do lots of nice computation and we go home? No, we just say, oh, we, want, uh, we can do so much more, let's, let's try and do more with it. In other words, what happens is it just makes things more feasible that we're just beyond the pale of imagination. They are now feasible. Therefore, we just want to expand the, our ability to how far we can go with parallel computing and, and, and uh, well, how far we can go with computing and we just think that we can now do much more. We can imagine maybe doing a microsecond simulation, actually do it for, uh, for, uh, for systems of interest. We can maybe imagine doing millisecond simulations. Uh, 
uh, for molecular dynamic systems. So it just makes us more hungry for power. That's what it does. So let's see. Um, what is happening with this parallel computing power is that people are not happy just uh, using one processor, partly because it now becomes feasible to use uh, larger machines and get even more power, partly because the hardware technology uh, is advanced enough, partly because it's cheap enough, people are building larger and larger machines. For example, machines with thousands of very powerful processors are there at various national centers. The one that me and my students uh, here routinely use is the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Centers, Lemieux. There is the NCSA Platinum that you are using. That's the, uh, and uh, so the Pittsburgh Lemieux machine has uh, 3,000 processors. Uh, there is a Department of Energy uh, machine, um, ASP White, um, that has, well, let's say 10,000 processors. Uh, and these machines, so the Pittsburgh machine, for example, can do five teraflops, five trillion, operation, trillion operations per second. So it's a very powerful machine. In, in raw performance, it can do that kind of uh, performance. If, uh, the most recent event in this uh, category was the unveiling of the Japanese Earth Simulator, which is a machine for simulating weather, long-term weather prediction, and so on. And it's a machine with a performance of 30 to 40 teraflops. It's the number one machine in the world at the moment, which is causing quite a bit of ripples in, uh, in the US uh, government circles. Uh, uh, and they, you expect some reaction from that, and uh, to regain our lead uh, in this field, you're going to see some, uh, uh, some large machines coming, coming up. Some of them, way before the Earth simulator uh, that were planned, uh, that is, not influenced by the Earth simulator design, but just had been planned from beforehand, uh, are, for example, the IBM Blue Gene machine. I'm sure many of you heard about it. Uh, the re reason it is called Blue Gene uh, is because they wanted to do a millisecond simulation for doing protein folding. They have since modified uh, their objectives a, a little bit, but the original opt objective was to do a 32,000 atom simulation um, for a millisecond time length within one year's uh, time frame. And so, uh, well, um, one millisecond is a huge amount of time when your time step is a femtosecond, right? So, um, so, uh, so that was the idea there. And the new idea, the modified idea, instead of using a million processor, which was the original idea, uh, a million fairly simple processors, they're using 128,000 fairly powerful processors, the PowerPC processors. And, uh, and this machine is real in the sense that it is, well, uh, this month probably will decide its uh, fate in some sense, but, uh, but I, IBM has already built a prototype of 512 processors. And this month, they, the Department of Energy is expected to order the full machine and will be built during the next year. So this machine will be around in 2004. And machines with teraflops, which is a word that didn't even probably exist a few years ago, and people still wondered, is it peta or penta flops, what? But it's that kind of machine is already uh, around the co a corner, which is 10 to the power 15 operations per second. Okay, very powerful machines are uh, being built. Second point is that but there are very few of these very powerful machines, still dozens of them, many, many more than uh, what people imagined a few years ago. But the bigger phenomena is that every lab, how many of you have a cluster near you? Pretty much everyone, right? You have clusters everywhere. Every lab has a cluster. It's become very affordable. Used to cost an engineering workstation would, would cost something like $50,000 to $100,000, and you can actually get a cluster or two for that price now. And so ob it's obvious that, uh, that that's the technology that, that's going to be uh, proliferating. In fact, this afternoon, uh, uh, you will learn about how to, uh, those of you who are going to that session will learn about how to put together uh, uh, your own cluster. Um, and the main attraction is they're inexpensive. You can, one other attraction which is somewhat like a mirage is that you look at making a new machine and you say, well, okay, I can buy this processor tomorrow and this three gigahertz processor, so you already have a lead on existing parallel machines that are sitting around the lab or accessible through NSF and so on because those are slightly older technology. So <coughs> you at least think that you're going to get a quickly, uh, very fast machine. I say it's a mirage because six months later, you realize, oh, that's not as fast as we thought. The next generation is already here. But you can quickly get a very fast um, a machine put together. The lead time is very small. So that's why clusters are very, uh, becoming very uh, uh, prevalent. 
And the third uh, direction, which is not taken off as much, is that using the desktop machines in a cluster. Okay, there's lots of desktop machines be sitting on people's uh, desks, not being used except when, so except when the user comes and runs some large uh, problem there. They're just typically idle. Can we not harness that power somehow to also run applications? The problem with that is that it's very non-homogeneous environment, and people haven't figured out how to use that well yet for a except for SETI at home type of uh, applications. So, but, but so, so those, those are some of the scenarios, the clusters on one side and large and parallel machines on the other side that push us towards or make it possible for us to use parallel uh, technology. At the same time, and because my talk is m mostly about parallel computing, I, I've listed other applications than the ones that, that we are focused on here. Uh, also, so it's, it seems like in a variety, I have collaborations in several different fields. It seems to me like there is a variety, uh, there's sort of a convergence in engineering, in operations research, in variety of fields. People are realizing that this technology gives you a competitive advantage. Even if you don't want to be bothered with parallel computing, if you ignore it, you ignore it at your peril because, uh, because someone else will and they will do it faster and better than you. So, so you have to pay attention to it, and there is more and more awareness in various fields. Uh, more positively, it's also clear that, uh, that various new breakthroughs are going to become feasible with uh, this new level of computing that's, uh, uh, that, that's uh, coming out. You can simulate rockets. You can simulate industrial processes like pouring of metal into, uh, into uh, moldings and so on and so forth, that how den de dendritic growth occurs and so on and a computational cosmology, OR, data mining, AI even maybe. And so a variety of fields are going to benefit uh, from, uh, are starting to benefit uh, from this. So, <clears throat> so that would sound like great thing, right? Therefore, you should all just go start using parallel computers tomorrow. Well, there are a couple of problems. Number one problem is it's not easy to develop an efficient parallel program. Probably easy to develop a parallel program, right? But not easy to develop an efficient parallel program. Um, and so this is one mistake that uh, people often make when they think of this technology is that think, okay, we buy a thousand processor machine, my program runs a thousand times faster, I'm done. I just have to put the money down and, and that's it. Not true because your program doesn't run. You have to write a separate program for, uh, for, for a parallel machine. Okay, and, uh, and, uh, and so that is very challenging because of parallel programming difficulties. Uh, and I'll get to those. Some of these issues I will get to, most of them uh, listed here, I will, I will get to in some detail. Um, and so parallel programming difficulties, the fact that people are using more complex algorithms, there are issues with memory performance, there are issues with communication cost and load balancing. Those are some that I will touch upon uh, a little bit. If you think about why don't applications scale, it's very easy to take a, a program, uh, convert it into a parallel program by some simple uh, hacking, and then look at the performance, and then you find out that on one processor it is such and such, on two processors it maybe sp speeds up a little bit, on four processors, okay, and then on 16 processors, nope, it's slowed down. 32 processors, adding 32 processors is worse than make, uh, running it on 16 processors and so on. That's a very common experience that people have when they parallelize an application. Why is that? Well, some things are just harder to do in parallel, right? Um, uh, it, it, just imagine, Parallel computing is very easy. In fact, uh, many of you are physicists and so on. And, uh, and so if I uh, talk about the issues of parallel computing, they seem like such a common sense issue that there is almost no, no intellectual quality to it. I have to, uh, uh, I have to live with that, but uh, at least in this crowd. Uh, but, uh, but it's a very simple issue. I can explain it in a cocktail party, uh, what the issues are in parallel computing. I say, okay, if there is something that one person is doing, and now we want f uh, in one office, and there are four people, uh, that, that you say, well, I want to get that done faster, and I employ four more people to work with that one person. Would it get faster necessarily? What issues will you encounter? Well, they would, how, uh, how they coordinate with each other, how they divide the work between them. Do they step, uh, end up stepping on each other's toes? Do they end up waiting for the same resource? Uh, and so on. So it's pretty complicated right, uh, right there. You won't get work done five times faster just because you have four more people, right? And so the same kind of thing happens here except we're talking about much finer time scales and a large number of processors. Speculative loss is when you want to do some uh, things in parallel, you say, okay, let me do this and this in parallel, but you need only one of them. One of them works, and then you throw away the work on the other. 
So that's speculative loss. In some cases, you have to do that. Most of the engineering applications of the kind that we focus here don't, but some kind of search applications do in, uh, in bioinformatics, for example. <clears throat> Load imbalance, uh, if you uh, makes all processors wait for the one that's slowest, and so that's one problem. Uh, and this is compounded by dynamic behavior. Uh, so the applications sometimes change their behavior dynamically as the atoms move and so on and so forth. You have <clears throat> communication overhead, where you spend increasing proportion of time on communication. You might have problems with critical paths, which means uh, dependencies between computations spread that are spread across processors. So I am waiting for that processor to do something, then I can do this, and then I pass on that data to someone else. You create a chain of dependencies, and your task cannot be finished uh, uh, for, with any less time than the length of the critical path. And long critical paths might be a cause of performance loss. Uh, you might have uh, bottlenecks where one processor is holding everyone else up. And this is slightly different than uh, load balancing, but we don't need to get into it. It's data dependence combined with uh, uh, load balancing. So these are some of the issues why it's hard to get parallel performance. Another thing that happens or has happened in the last few years is that people have started to use more complex algorithms. Just because your computers got faster and you started using um, parallel computer doesn't mean how to use that power. So suppose you're doing fluid dynamics. Suppose you're doing weather simulation. You are doing a 12 kilometer grid. Well, you're doing a 40 kilometer grid, let's say. So you put a 40 kilometer grid around the earth and then you get certain number of uh, cells and you compute. Uh, you say, okay, I got a faster computer. I'm going to make 20 kilometer grid. Okay, and I got even, so that's, well, assuming third dimension is uh, similarly reduced, that will be eight times more work, right? Number of cubes will be eight times more if each dimension is reduced by half. So, uh, eight times more work, sounds great. Now if I got even more faster computer, well, reduce it to 10 kilometer. Even faster computer, reduce it to five kilometer. That logic doesn't work eventually because eventually you are computing lots of garbage, lots of uh, a huge area which is very uniform, has the same pressure, temperature, and so on. There's nothing happening there, and still we are dividing into large number of chunks. So you're just wasting your computation. You would like to do it more adaptively, refine where there is a storm, uh, keep it coarse when, where, it, where it is uh, uniform, right? And this kind of thing then makes the algorithms more complex. So this is most uh, uh, clearly seen in the context of the domain that we are dealing with here in terms of suppose you want to do just an electrostatic force calculation between a bunch of atoms, right? You have n atoms and you want to do electrostatic force calculation. Every atom exerts a force on every other atom. That's n square calculations. And you can do those n square calculations and you can parallelize that algorithm reasonably well. It, it has its own challenges, but it's a reasonably easy, uniform, everyone is doing the same type of computation. You just have to worry about Newton's law uh, and the symmetry arising from that a little bit. But other than that, it's a fairly straightforward, uniform computation to parallelize. But that's n squared. Fine if you're using 1,000 atoms or 100 atoms. If you start using 10,000 atoms, that's 10,000 square calculations there. And so new algorithms have come up that reduce the complexity. For example, for periodic systems, you might use particle mesh AWOD, or you might use fast multiple algorithms, and, uh, and, and these give you n log n operations instead of n squared. It's a tremendous reduction, 10,000 square versus 10,000 multiplied by what? How much? 10,000 multiplied by log of 10,000 to the base two, which is this computer science -y thing to do, is to do log, of, log to the base two of everything. 1,000 is 10, okay? And so 10,000 would be uh, 13, <laughs> 13 to 14. Okay, so 14 multiplied by 10,000 rather than 10,000 multiplied by 10,000. Much smaller number of operations. Of course, there's some constants that are the multiplicative constant in some number of operations. Uh, but, uh, but now, main important point is the computation time decreased tremendously. However, the algorithm got much more complicated to parallelize, much, much more complicated to parallelize and get speed ups out of, okay? So you can't say, we computer scientists can't go and say, hey, come on, we give us that easier algorithm. That's much nicer to parallelize. No, because it gives you such a tremendous benefit in terms of number of operation counts that speed up is not the criteria. Finish time is the criteria. And so we have to parallelize these more complex algorithms. So that's another challenge. You might want to do multiple time stepping. So, that, uh, so you say, well, uh, the, the uh, particle mesh evolved is still expensive rather than compared with cutoffs, so we're going to do it every so many steps further complicates parallelization, right? 
uh, you might want to do QM, uh, MM combined for the complicase parallelization. One domain you want to do uh, uh, ab initio calculation and uh, in the rest of the system you want to do a uh, uh, standard classical molecular mechanics. Still complicated. So, so parallelization is complicated by modern complex algorithms. Let's uh, shift to a, a couple of other factors that I mentioned. Let's look at memory performance. Um, the memory that's available today, when you go to the Best Buy and buy, you know, 256 megabytes to put into your computer, is quite fast, okay, and very cheap actually compared with just a few years ago. 30 to 50 nanoseconds to get data from the memory into CPU. Sounds fast enough, but remember our CPU is doing one oper several operations every 330 picoseconds. Aha. That means our memory is about 100 times slow. Imagine working with someone else who is 100 times slower than you, <laughs> okay? Uh, so that's what the CPU is doing mostly. Does one addition, waits for the data to come to it for 100 time units, and does one more addition. Ah, uh, that's not going to work. And so, uh, so this has actually become a, a higher and higher. This ratio has become worse and worse over the years. It used to be maybe 5, 10, 15, 50. Now it's more than 100. Um, and it shows no sign of abating that, uh, that uh, trend. So the solution to, to that that's used, of course, is uh, memory hierarchy, uh, which means you use a small but uh, fast memory uh, called a cache. Um, and so, uh, so if the data fits in your cache memory, which is typically, well, there are, le uh, level, there are levels, multiple levels of caches, which is why it gets called uh, memory hierarchy. But if it f uh, fits in one of these levels of caches, then your, uh, your computation can be very fast. And we can go into the principles of how to improve cache performance, but the basic idea is once you bring some data into the cache, you want to use it as many times as possible before letting it go away back into memory. Okay, that's kind of the basic principle, and that complicates, of course, programming, uh, programming quite a bit. But more importantly, that's the reason why you can, one of the reasons why you cannot get the peak performance that your CPU uh, t tells you. So if you have a 3,000 processor machine, each one capable of uh, two gigaflops, uh, so you expect uh, six teraflops out of it, right? And your actual application is going to give you 500 gigaflops. Uh, so, so this is very common, actually. And so what is that? So uh, one, someone uh, said once that peak performance that these manufacturers advertise is actually the performance that the machine is guaranteed not to exceed. That's the way to look at it. So six teraflops is a performance is guaranteed not to exceed. Um, so, uh, so this is one of the reasons why it doesn't approach, uh, approach it. Um, so, so you have to worry about this issue, and we have to worry about communication cost. Now, this was a communication between memory and CPU. What about another CPU that's sitting somewhere else? It turns out there is a tremendous improvement in communication networks, but if you just use a 100 megabit e uh, Ethernet that you use uh, around the lab, uh, then what do you get? Well, let's get, let's get at some, uh, some concepts here, uh, so, uh, some, some basic ideas of communication, some words uh, to be defined. So how much data can you get across from this processor to this processor per unit time? We'll call that the bandwidth, okay? So this is where you're just piping data, megabytes and megabytes of data, what rate does it uh, go there, okay? Second point is, um, if you just send a tiny little piece of information, one byte from here to here, how long does it take to get from here to here? Okay, that those two are not directly related. It's not like you can just take the inverse of one and get the other. Imagine a train leaving a station and going to the other station, right? Long train. The latency is the engine of the train leaving the first station and reaching the second station, right? Well, actually, that's a bad example uh, uh, for a variety of reasons because, because the train keeps uh, moving all its uh, cars at the sa same rate. But bandwidth is how fast, uh, how many uh, cars cross the line at one particular point, uh, point there. Those two are slightly different concepts, especially in, uh, in the compu uh, computer world. Uh, so typically what happens is for one byte information, you have a lot of overhead to send. Even in that engine example, you can see if you have a long distance, if I'm sending a train from here to far away there, right, it's going to take me a long time for the engine to reach there. But if the train is running at a speed of 100 miles per hour, that's the bandwidth. That's the rate at which the cars are going to uh, cross into the, into the station. If I'm sending the, uh, it to something that's close by two miles away, then I have smaller latency, but I have the same bandwidth, right? So, uh, so that's the latency. Now, the third concept, which is uh, often ignored, is CPU overhead. So yes, I'm sending a 
kilobyte message from myself to yourself, a thousand bytes from me to you. Question is, it took um, 10 microseconds, let's see. What fraction of that 10 microsecond did I, the CPU, have to spend on that message? And what other fraction could I actually do other useful computation? So the CPU over it is the time that the CPU needs to pay attention to that data transfer, right? Um, and these are important concepts. Like I said, I'm going to just, uh, because of the mix uh, that, I, that I have here, I'm going to introduce some concepts, and then I'm going to go deeper in, uh, in some areas, but, uh, and, and maybe stay shallow in some other, uh, some other areas. So, so what do you do uh, with this? This becomes an important concept because of the next slide that I'll show. Um, well, let me actually uh, first graphically show you what I mean. Suppose those two lines show, uh, represent two processors, and along x-axis is the time. Then when you're about to send a message, what, what happens is your CPU sends, spends some time on sending the message. Then your co you might have a coprocessor, the network interface card or some other coprocessor. That might spend some time on it while the CPU is free to do other things. Then the message may go uh, across, oh, let's see where the laser pointer is. A pointer. I thought it was here, right here, but I seem to have misplaced it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is the la uh, pure uh, network latency, the data that uh, is on the wire or in the switching network somewhere. This is the receiving coprocessor, and this is the receiving processor, right? So that's what is the anatomy of a data going from one processor to another processor. If you look at some of the common... Um, uh, common uh, networks, actually let me skip over this since we are, uh, so if you look at 100 megabit ethernet, latency may be of the order of as high as 100 microseconds because you spend a lot of time in the operating system because of the layers and layers of software through which the data goes. The CPU overhead because of that is very high, in the bandwidth you'll get something like 5 to 10 megabytes. Remember this is 100 megabit ethernet, so you would get somewhere between 5 to 10 megabytes uh, bandwidth. If you buy much more expensive mirinet, your latency might come down to 15 microseconds. Uh, your CPU over it is pretty low, and you might get bandwidth of that order. It's pretty expensive. If you buy something like Quadrix, which is what the uh, Pittsburgh uh, Supercomputer uh, Center uses, your latency is much lower, your bandwidth is much higher, your dollars are much higher, right? And actually, this is a trade-off. And in fact, there's one small paper that uh, we co-authored where we actually analyzed what you need to plot on x-axis uh, when you want to do speed up is cost, not number of processors. So it might seem, oh, we must get this. Well, that's if money is not an issue. So if, uh, if you add the cost of processors and the system, then you say, I have $50,000 to spend. Should I do it this way or this way? You can run your benchmark on both or simulate or figure out and then figure out which kind of system will be good for you. So although this is good, this is still useful because it's commodity and it's much, much cheaper. Um, so, uh, so the important point about the CPU time is made here. If you look at the Le Pittsburgh machine, which is called Lemieux, uh, you can see that if you send this is message size and uh, this is the uh, t time to finish. You can see that about 10,000 or 20,000 bytes here, your completion time is of the order of 200 uh, microseconds, whereas the amount of the time CPU needs to spend on it is very, very small, 10, 20 microseconds. 150 microseconds or something like that, your CPU has in between, in which it can do what? A lot of computations. Right, 150 microseconds is, 100, uh, is maybe almost half a million floating point operations it can do during that time. Um, so, all right, so that's the communication aspect. Um, writing parallel programs, why is it difficult? It's difficult because of these race conditions and coordination issues. Race conditions, you don't encounter any of these in sequential programming. Race conditions are where two pro pro uh, processors are running uh, uh, in parallel, and they try to do some, uh, something, but in different runs, they will do them in different orders. So I, the third processor, might receive message from this guy first and this guy second, or this guy first and this guy second, depending on just the particular run you're doing. And so my behavior may depend on what happened at runtime, and unless my program is carefully written, I, I might fall into some traps there. So race conditions are one problem, uh, and, and, and the fact that you have to worry about performance while writing the program is another problem. People have tried, and don't. This is this is just in the nature of warning that people have tried automatic parallelization, and it hasn't worked well. There's a tremendous amount of research on it, very good research, but for practical applications, uh, going to hundreds of processors or even 32 processors, this technique 
take, I take your program, program and automatically parallelize it hasn't worked. Uh, what has worked is MPI where you specify everything. You just tell every processor what you're going to do every moment. Um, what might, so that's a lot of effort uh, on what might work and my group's research is on that is some intermediate idea that we call processor virtualization where programmer, well, I'll tell you about what that idea is if we have time in a few minutes. Um, and, 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 and the other idea is frameworks where commonly used parallel patterns are reused. So you don't have to program every application that does molecular dynamics or any particle to uh, spatial decomposition of particles shouldn't have to do how to migrate particles part. It should be just available in the framework and library in some fashion. So that's another um, method. So these are basic methods uh, of coping with the complexity of parallel co uh, computing. So I told you I'll tell you about virtualization. Basically the idea is, and, uh, is that you, the programmer divides the computation into a large number of interacting objects. You can think of them as objects, you can think of them as threads or virtual processors, and you let the runtime system figure out who does what, which processor does what work. So in other words, you, automagic parallelization doesn't work because compilers are not good enough to figure, decompose the problem into independent parts. You decompose it into independent parts, and then the other problem of who does what is still equally important. You give that problem away to the, uh, to the runtime system, which can intelligent, do some intelligent observation about what's going on in the application to map those uh, differently. Okay, so, uh, so there are two systems in my group uh, called CHAMP++ and Adaptive MPI that actually embody this idea of virtualization. And those of you who are interested uh, can f uh, pursue that by uh, following that link. Um, and this technique turns out to have lots of advantages. All that I want to say about it is that the, once you give the runtime system the ability to move work around, small pieces of work around, then it can use that ability in a variety of ways to automatically checkpoint your job, to optimize your load balancing, to optimize your communication, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so what, what I'm going to do in a few minutes uh, is to show, well actually first I just wanted to show you a nice picture to tell you that I know something about molecular dynamics. This picture is, of course, from, uh, uh, from Professor Shulton's uh, students. But it's a NAMD simulation of aquaparin uh, that was used by the NSF uh, uh, director, Rita Colwell, in her address at supercomputing. Now, at that same supercomputing, we presented uh, uh, the performance results for the molecular dynamics. And my intention here is to show you uh, some issues that arise in parallelize, that arose in the parallelization uh, of that, that, that program. So I'm going to try and do this review in about seven minutes time, or maybe uh, I had, um, yeah, uh, and uh, all right, so let's, let's see. I might skip over the ab initio MD preliminary results that I had in mind. If, if you're interested, I can uh, tell you about that later. So in uh, molecular dynamics, you all understand that uh, what's involved is Newtonian mechanics really more, in most of the times uh, use force fields of various kinds. Number of atoms is not huge like in cosmology. The number of particles may be large. Here it is 10,000 to 500,000. Um, at each time step, um, <clears throat> you have to do uh, quite a bit of uh, work here and you might have to do multiple time stepping if you're using particle mesh evolve. Challenge is you have femtosecond time step and you, have, you need millions millions and millions of the time steps. So each, th each piece of work that you're trying to parallelize is very small. So although the whole computation may last a year or a month or whatever, but the, uh, the, uh, the, what's available to you is one time step, and that's very tiny, okay? So maybe, uh, so it, actually if I look at uh, uh, how tiny, uh, we, we had something like um, a program that took uh, seven seconds, six seconds on, uh, on one processor. That was the assimilation of APO lipoprotein, right? And so that's a 90,000 atom system it takes only about six uh, seconds on one CPU. Now if you want to use 1,000 CPUs for that, it's going to be challenging, right? So, um, okay. So another, because it's supposed to be an issues in parallel computing, I want to introduce one notion, but uh, we don't have time to discuss the math behind the notion. But the idea here is that, very simple concept is, if I, double the number of processors, I should be able to retain the parallel efficiency by increasing the problem size, okay? And in particular, if you use that criteria, what happens is the corollary is all that I want to point you to is that if communication to computation ratio, the amount I spend in communicating and the amount I spend in compu computing uh, for, a pro uh, for a problem of size n running on p processors, just increases with p, it can scale. So the traditional approach for 
uh, molecular uh, dynamics, which arises simply because you're taking existing program, you're taking an existing sequential program and trying to parallelize it, you typically replicate data. So every process has all the atoms, um, and non-bonded forces are distributed evenly, and everyone deposits the forces to all the atoms, and then you do a big uh, uh, summing of forces across processors. So it turns out that the computation is proportional to the number of atoms. Let's assume cutoff for right now. It's proportional to the number of atoms in, and so four processor computation is n over p. The communication each processor has to engage in is log of p number of processors to send its data to everyone else using the most efficient algorithm. So that's n log p. And so if you take the communication to computation ratio, that's n log p divided by n over p. That's p log p. There's no n left in this to balance it, to trade it off. So you cannot increase the problem size and say, okay, if I increase the problem size, my computation increases, and therefore even though the communication also increases slightly, it's okay. It doesn't happen because your ratio cancels out n, and there is nothing left for you to, uh, to, to balance with. In other words, if you go to larger and larger number of processes, no matter what with this algorithm, no matter how many atoms you are dealing with, your communication is going to become increasing fraction of your time. Um, so it's not scalable. So, uh, well, when I'm just before lunch, I need to ha use devices to keep you awake. So, uh, so if you decompose the atoms across, uh, across processors, uh, then nearby atoms may not still be on the same process. Say atom number one to 100 go here and so on. And so what happens is communication is still order n, communication to computation ratio becomes p, still not scalable. You can try some of these other schemes that have become very popular, uh, so-called Plimpton scheme or a variant of that uh, which is uh, proposed by Joel Sals and his group, where you dis distribute the force matrix in a square block fashion across processors. And this might be a trap that you might want to, uh, this is very easy to, uh, to convince yourself that it's a pretty good thing, but given the cutoff uh, uh, that are used, uh, it turns out, well, irrespective of that actually, it turns out that this also is not scalable because it's much better than the previous ones, but the ratio of communication to computation is still square root of p, proportional to square root of p, has no n in the denominator for you to balance it with, okay? So none of those work. What works is spatial decomposition, um, and uh, so I'm going to just show you what I mean by that. Spatial decomposition is when you put atoms into cubes of some a fixed size, let's we use, uh, cubes of size proportional to the, uh, uh, to the cutoff distance. And so here, communication computation ratio is one. It's okay, it, it scales, except it has some load balance problems and the amount of parallelism you get is limited. Because uh, if you put the whole thing in 12 angstrom boxes or 14 angstrom boxes, you're not going to have that many boxes to run on 2,000 processors. So what we do instead is we actually say for every pair of boxes that are adjacent to each other, we create another object, another uh, virtual processor, uh, which is responsible for calculating the force between them, and we then distribute these virtual processors across physical processors using the technique that I just described earlier. Um, no time to describe the bond forces uh, technique, uh, but, um, okay. So, uh, so I want to show you a couple of things that we did to run it on the Lemieux machine last year uh, at the Supercomputing 2002. Uh, time time frame. So, well, skip over those. Um, so the basic uh, basic parallelization, and this is one thing that I wanted to show you uh, about parallelization, is that okay? So this particular benchmark that we had uh, we had chosen, uh, which is the F1 subunit of the uh, ATPs, uh, had about 700 cubes. Not enough, of course, to go to 3,000 processors. But if you consider all the pairs of neighboring processors and make each one of them a virtual processor, you get about 10,000, 9,800 virtual processors uh, that way. Uh, and then of course for every, uh, so as many as there are cubes, there are as many objects for calculating bonded forces. We, I just call them angle compute objects here. And the flow of control is that these guys multicast their coordinates to the appropriate sets of uh, uh, compute objects, and then you do reductions from them uh, to get the forces added up, and then, uh, then you continue, do the integration here, then you continue, right? Well, it turns out that that, 10,000 object is still not good enough for 3,000 processors. Why? Because some of them are too big. So if you look at, uh, well, uh, if you, uh, so what we did actually is say some of these objects which actually may correspond to uh, cubes facing each other or on a face, then they are too big. And so what we do for that is uh, we break them into multiple pieces, you know, three, four, five pieces for, uh, uh, 
for, for each one. So we have 30,000 virtual processors, and then the rest of the computation is similar. We get a mode of about 700 microseconds per computation. This is x-axis is the computation time for each pair of cubes, the amount of force, uh, time needed to do the force calculation. And for some of them, it indeed needs uh, more than a few milliseconds, two or two and a half milliseconds. But most of them are in the 700 microsecond uh, say, uh, second range, which is small enough, right? Bec uh, because our computation was about 25 seconds sequentially. If you want to run it on 2,000 processors, it would be 12 milliseconds. And uh, no nothing should be a significant fraction of that 12 millisecond, or definitely should, no part should be bigger than 12 milliseconds. So that's achieved by, by this. Um, we can do automatic load balancing, and I want to show you what we mean by that. We do some regular time steps. If you run MD uh, this afternoon, you'll uh, see uh, how that works. And then we actually run some time steps where the runtime system monitors and measures how much computation ha is happening in each one of those uh, pieces of work, each one of those objects. After that, a centralized, uh, the, the data is brought into one place where a, the graph of communication and the computation load is analyzed and an aggressive strategy is used then to create a new mapping of objects to processors. You move work uh, from processor to processor and then you start the computation. After you start the computation a little while, you again do a refinement uh, to just to see whether you moved everyone around and of course your assumptions are all wrong now so you look at things again and you do one more just uh, a tinkering load balancing where you just move a few of them around uh, to take work away from the heaviest loaded processors and by doing that uh, and then you then on you can just do uh, a refinement every once in a while every 10,000 steps or so um, so that's basically the load balancing strategy that's used I should skip over to the uh, so, uh, to the performance data, but I wanted to show you one piece here. This is a one of the performance tools that you will use this afternoon uh, called projections. Each one of these lines represents a processor, and this is from a 2,000 processor run, uh, and some subsets of processors are shown. That's, for example, you can't read it, but that's processor number 1,490-something. Uh, the red colors that you see are the integrations happening inside the cubes. Blue are the force computations, and notice that there is no global barrier, normal computation would require you to all come together here, then start the next step. You don't wait for uh, everyone to do their re energy reductions and so on, and that actually helps improve your performance. So this is one of those things, esoteric topics that those of you interested in parallel computing issues should look at, uh, look at this. So I'm going to skip over to the, uh, to the results section now. Um, so, well, okay. So, so far what I showed you was uh, without the particle mesh evolved. Uh, if we add particle mesh evolved, what happens is you have to, uh, you, uh, every so many time step, you have to actually do a global computation. And that global, global computation adds a new set of virtual processors. Basically, these cubes send their data uh, to a 3D grid, which itself is partitioned across processors. So this is a 3D uh, grid over which the uh, the, the, the charge, uh, char charges are distributed, and then, um, uh, and then from that, the particle mesh evolved algorithm involves an FFT, which involves a transpose into another differently distributed uh, data pattern. So you do a 2D FFT here, a 1D FFT here, do some uh, computation here, then transpose it back and do, uh, do a uh, 2D FFT here back again, and then you have, then you send the results and forces back to all, all the cubes, right? So, uh, so, uh, so, so this is a calculation that gets added. Now, notice that, interestingly, this can happen concurrently with this. So while other, uh, some processes are working on this, some processes might be working on that, okay? And so this kind of concurrent overlap is a useful technique uh, to get good, good parallel performance. And then again, in the particle mesh evolved itself, the 3D FFT needed to be parallelized very, uh, efficiently, and that required us to uh, do a more efficient transpose operation that I will skip over. Um, uh, transpose, actually, it's a nice picture. Might as well show you the picture uh, since I have to zip through it anyways. A transpose operation requires this plane, which contains the charge distribution here. After doing the FFT here, what I need to do is send this pencil here. So basically, I'm sending this pencil to this guy, this pencil to this guy, and that last pencil to the last guy. Pencil is just a row of numbers, right? And everyone else is doing the same thing, 
So this is the communication operation. Remember what I said, in each communication operation, there is a certain fixed cost, alpha. Remember when we are talking about communication, we, send, we may spend a lot of time on the CPU setting up the message, but the time per byte may not be as much. The bandwidth is pretty high. We have to take advantage of that somehow to reduce the cost of doing all this messaging that's involved in this, okay? And so, uh, so, so we actually used a strategy where we, uh, where, we, uh, where we reduce the number of messages, and this is again for those of you who are interested in such issues, where we reduce the number of messages at the cost of sending every piece of data twice. So whatever data needs to go from me to that column, I send to this guy, and it will forward it to the, uh, within its column in a second phase. So using something like a FedEx strategy, you can call it, you, you actually get a better performance by doing that. So lambda performance was improved by using strategies such as that. And this is a slightly older uh, uh, table, and you're not going to actually look at the numbers in the table, so let me show you the next graph, which is, uh, which is a plot here. We, what we get now is an AMD performance today on 3,000 processor is uh, on, on, uh, on uh, going from 1,000 processors to 3,000 processors, you go from about uh, 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 12 uh, Gigaflops, is that right? Something wrong here with that scale. But we go reach 1,000, uh, oh, th that's, uh, that's 400 gigaflops to one point something teraflops. So we have achieved a tera over a teraflop performance. A uh, slightly earlier version of this achieved close to a teraflop performance, and that's the one that got the Garden Bell Award last year at supercomputing. If you look at the time per step, it's come down to about 12 milliseconds. So every 12 millisecond, it's finishing one computation time step, which is a fairly narrow time and induces its own challenges in parallelization. So, um, so I would stop, uh, stop with that. I have uh, uh, the, uh, some other applications that we're working on. One of them in, uh, includes the ab initio molecular dynamics that I'm working with uh, for Sir Klein and, uh, um, and, and others, um, uh, Glenn Martin and Mark Tuckerman and so on. We have some preliminary parallelization results on that. Um, and if you're interested, I could talk to you about that as well. All right, thanks. Very good point. Uh, so first of all, each box should be treated by one processor. Many boxes map to one processor, but you're right in that, uh, uh, in that uh, at least the uh, boxes corresponding to the multiple, uh, uh, multiple different adjacent atoms will be on different processors. So here actually is the slide that I skipped on that topic. Um, so basically what we do is, okay, here are adjacent boxes. There may be a bond. What we do is we say the bond forces will be calculated by the box that has the ma So for example, if there is an atom here and two atoms here, the bonded forces between them will be calculated here. If you take the x, uh, y, x coordinates of uh, the cube in which uh, uh, that atom is and that atom is, take the max of that, which gives you this. Take the y coordinate of that, coordinates bo that atom's box and this atom's box and take a max of that, that gives you this, and so that x, y coordinate is, is the box where it gets calculated. Everyone sends their data to their upstream neighbors, okay? So, uh, so you send seven messages uh, to the seven upstream neighbors instead of 26 messages to all your neighbors. I can explain that to you later. Right. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, there are two kinds of reasons for that. One is 
the Lemieux machine has 3,000 processors. They're organized into 750 nodes of four processors each. As soon as you start using all four processors on each node, the operating system interference starts uh, kicking in, and, uh, and basically the system says, hey, I need to run something, and that slows down your computation. That's basically what's happening. And of course, some of, some of that is as you increase the number of processors, your parallel efficiency tends to go down simply because you have more severe load balancing problem, increased fraction of time spent on communication, and so on. That's my judgment at the moment. It, it's a combination of both, but the largest contribution is the Lemieux specific problem. What do you expect if you keep the physical processors same and increase the number of virtual processors? What do you expect for the same problem? It should, same. it should be the same, right? And in fact, it is that, except as you keep increasing it, eventually the overhead will start becoming too much, right? Well, but there is another effect that comes to your aid, which is the cache performance. Remember I talked about the cache behavior? And actually what happens is if you increase the number of virtual processors, each virtual processor is smaller and smaller, has smaller and smaller footprint in terms of the data that is using. Therefore, it fits better in cache. So once you start working on one virtual processor, you're reusing more of its data. And so the cache performance actually improves. And so that actually makes it better to use more virtual processors. So it's a heuristic as to figuring out exactly what number of virtual processors is good for an application. For NAMD, it was a, a fairly natural division of the application, gives rise to the 30,000 virtual processors for that benchmark. So that was adequate. NAMD what again? Ah, uh -huh. well, well, I'm in a public podium. I don't know how much I want to talk about uh, grid, uh, grid stuff. Okay, here, there are grid is uh, grid has the two attributes. Number one, you can submit a job anywhere from anywhere to anywhere, right? And that using the grid as a utility for compute power. And that is definitely very useful. We have projects on that. BioCore already does uh, some of that and, and, and uh, in some direction. And we have a project called Faucets that takes it in another direction where all these clusters can be, in fact, I invite you all to look at that. Bartering system between clusters is one of the things that we are uh, playing with. The other aspect of grid is to run a single simulation with one foot on this parallel machine, other foot on that parallel machine. I think that's workable only for a small fraction of applications and bio, uh, molecular dynamics is not one of them because you need fairly 12 millisecond for each time step. What are you going to do? It takes 50 milliseconds to, uh, for the signal to go from here to California and back. So <laughs> it's not going to work that way. Oh, two, two things. First of all, the clusters on the desktop will become, clusters will become more powerful and they can become, they can become desktops. For example, this IBM technology that I talked about for BlueGene, uh, uh, they might come up with a teraflop board that can plug into the, uh, into the back of your computer. It might be expensive, but not much more expensive than a workstation was. Um, the national centers, though, would have very, very large parallel computers. The, it's, it's something that is actually, that's one uh, good that you asked that question. Next two weeks, there, there is a big set of meetings going on in Washington, D.C. in response to the uh, Japanese Earth Simulator. And they're going to decide basically the next five-year funding priorities and the directions. And so it could go one of two ways. One, they might decide we need to have some huge big machines. And second direction is maybe we need to have lots of 2,000 processor, 4,000 processor machines. So I don't know which one of these two, and maybe it will be both, but that's the direction I expect. So, so clusters will be in our desktop, and, and the few 
those process and machines will be very light and pretty common. Pretty common at centers, yes. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's because it adopted one of the, at least the early uh, ones adopted the approach, one of these approaches that I, uh, that I termed as non-scalable. So replicated, uh, replicated data was one of the first approaches for Charm, which is actually for, uh, pretty good as long as you're focused on 16 processor uh, machines, right? Because it requires you to modify your program the least, the sequential program the least. Um, I don't think there's anything fundamental, of course, and in fact, we are talking with uh, the Charm developers and they might think things might come out of that. Amber has different module structure and depends on someone develops a parallel module that's scalable, then, then it works well. Not all modules in Amber scale that, that well. So that's the short answer. Um, it can pick up the slack is, is the best way of looking at it. It's actually meant to be just within a single process. And what it can do, it's compiler generated uh, hyperthreading usually. So you wouldn't use it as, wh what it does is, remember I said the memory is very slow, so the process is running along, it's waiting for the memory. Well, let something else run for a while. So that something else can be the same program, another iteration of the loop, for example, can be doing that. So it's just picking up the slack for operations like that. It doesn't have an additional floating point unit, additional uh, integer unit, anything like that, um, but it can use the delay uh, that it's wait when it's waiting for memory. Okay. Jim, yeah. You just need a better cluster management uh, uh, software. You should use BioCore. Tell me, is someone from BioCore, do, you, do we uh, monitor jobs right now? Or we will, if you are not doing it right now, we, we, we plan to, anyone? But uh, that is one of the things. We need to be able to monitor the job, then as soon as one processor crashes, it should kill all the rest of the job, and maybe start it from the last checkpoint automatically, right? You shouldn't have to do that yourself, but yeah. I mean, so the monitoring software like that is lacking right now, yes. Of uh, the, 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 the
because of the nature of love and what uh, they have ventured to in their income uh, bonus, mm -hmm. and then we have time that they can come to know. And also a time of death, but then only it can be a little bit. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, uh, this let me answer that quick, uh, very quickly. Fault tolerant uh, software is is a very active research issue, and especially for trees, it's doable. However, it's not done yet. Okay. And secondly, there is always a forward path cost that people don't want to pay. Okay. I can make NAMD or any f application fault tolerant with some effort if you are allowed to uh, make it three times slower. Use triple modular redundancy, for example. But no one wants to do that. They would rather checkpoint and restart. Right, right. Just that you have to restore the data in exactly the same state from somewhere, and that's more complicated. But it, yeah. Some questions. First, I have um, a main tag, uh, Heng Liang. Heng Liang. Then uh, the beauty contest. So we got some wonderful entries. Unfortunately, we got actually more than we can handle, and it was very, it was breaking our heart to make a, to make a, a to make a cut here. But uh, uh, I think it's better that we that we focus on a few rather than that we that we give all entries uh, an opportunity. The, 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 the selection was strictly by what we thought is more popular rather than by what we think is quality. So there's really nothing with quality. In fact, we, we feel that some of the quality was cut away because, you know, like very high uh, might be actually, uh, you know, like beyond maybe what the summer school topic could be. Anyway, uh, we have six entries that will be presented uh, on uh, Thursday at uh, 7.30. The first one is by Yen Li Wang and Karunesh Arora uh, on RAF1 Kinase. The second one is by Hen Liang um, on molecular dynamics of uh, release factor ERF1. The third one is uh, by uh, Philip Fowler and Shantenu Ya on uh, DNA, SMD, and force fields, or how I learned to stop worrying and love SMD. <laughs> the next one is by uh, Will Scheffler, uh, Rational Design of Snake Toxin as Molecular Marker. Uh, then uh, the entry is, has been selected by Zen Wu Liu, SMD study of sodium ion permeation across gramicidin A channel. And finally, um, by Scott S uh, Stagg, molecular simulation of a distorted transfer RNA is transfer RNA a molecular spring. So again, the ones which were not selected were really just not selected because maybe you could almost say we think this, this presentation have the highest entertainment value. And so, you know, we forgive us. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, I would like to ask these six groups to come down here that we arrange a time where they can uh, prepare their presentation on this computer that will be tomorrow afternoon between four and seven o'clock. Uh, please uh, remember when you uh, had your cluster session so that we may work around it. Uh, so this was, uh, and then of course, I, I really invite you all to be present uh, at 7.30 because 
you are the judges, nobody from, no local is allowed to judge, and uh, so you have to then listen to it. It will be 10 minute presentation and two minutes question, and we then expect three minute uh, transfer time, uh, so that we each contribution will be 50 minutes. We will have to be fair and tough, and we cannot uh, have somebody speak for 20 minutes and then uh, make a much better impression than uh, the other ones who speak only their fair allotment. So uh, please prepare your presentations really for 10 minutes. And then we have, we cannot ask many questions, but without questions, I think it wouldn't make any sense. So we should give people a chance to make up by answering uh, some pointed questions. And uh, okay, so uh, you come down here and we do this. If there are any further questions, uh, we could.